Now, I've been following Chris Papa since he's been the mayor of the Umgeni province, right? But now he's campaigning for the premier of KwaZulu Natal, KZN. And two days ago, he had actually gave this really powerful speech in the last DA um, rally in KZN, which was said to be the largest um, rally by the DA. I think there were 10,000 members, 10,000 people in the crowd. And he had this really historic speech where he features both Isizulu, his fluency in Isizulu, and also in English, and it, it is really mind-blowing. Um, let's listen to his speech, and I'll be back for some analysis about some things I wish to speak about whiteness in South Africa. Nina Bessilo! Afeniba Shenam Shanje! San Bonani, good afternoon! What a historic and wonderful day to be part of the Democratic Alliance here in KwaZulu-Natal. During the struggle years, this stadium, Curry's Fountain, was a place where all races assembled for political gatherings, sports matches, and friendship. In this place, people were united in their goal to bring freedom to our great country. There has been no greater triumph for our nation than the freedom that we gained from the oppressive apartheid regime. 30 years ago, in 1994, we gained our freedom to choose our government and our leaders. This year, on the 29th of May, we will again be given the opportunity, the responsibility to exercise our democratic right and vote to choose a new government in KwaZulu-Natal. I was born in 1991, just two years after Nelson Mandela was released from that lonely prison cell. That same Robben Island prison cell where Jacob Zuma wants to send pregnant teenagers. Island I was just two years old when our parents and our grandparents voted in the first democratic election. Abaning Babo Babenova Longa Lesos Kat. Babenga is good to yin lend yen dandu ening. Lanas fundazweni begunembi. Abandu Babenova lo yen dandu ening. But they had courage. They had courage to believe in something better. Baben is bin your kolele in the eng on. They had the courage to be driven by hope and not fear. I am proud of our democracy, but I am sad that the potential we have has been wasted and that the government leaders of today have done nothing to further our lives. There is no doubt that we honor those who fought and died for our freedom. But today, Namsanje, 30 years later, we are still waiting for true freedom, and we are still waiting for this supposed new dawn. 30 years after the fall of apartheid, Abant Balelizwe, the people of this province, they are still oppressed. We must liberate our province, we must liberate our country from the new forms of oppression that this current government brings upon us. And people are still locked in poverty. Fellow Democrats, friends, since we launched this campaign exactly two months ago, I have traveled each and every corner of the province. On the Durban beachfront, that was once bustling with tourists and small businesses, I met Mr. Ngele, 
umuntu omusha ongakwazi ukuthola umsebenzi noma anayo i-degree ya social work Mr Ngele lives in the back room of a mortuary next to dead bodies uhlale ma cousin lana ethekwin he is 32 years old ulingana nami as he explained his story to me he said that all he wanted lenta ilindela yona was just clean clothes so that he could go and look for a job ubefuna ingubo ukuzigqoka uzokwazi ukuyothola amathubo omsebenzi the biggest issue in this election in the haba panwili nazo zonke is jobs and growing this economy fanele sakho amathubo omsebenzi sikhulisa lomnotho and as your premier i will work to create 300,000 real jobs amathubo angempela I am a peace job. And I will make sure that we end this system where only those 18 to 35 can access opportunities. So I vala lent your good abandon by 18 to 35 coupon. In Chatsworth, I visited small business owners in the Bangladesh market. Small business owners who have put their children through school for generations and as your premier i will make it easier for these small businesses to survive as small business owners are the bedrock of our economy yeah so what do you guys think really powerful speech really powerful and i like the fact that he speaks really fluent isizulu okay um he's been born i think somewhere around uh, around that region and he's grown to learn uh the language really really perfectly and and it's clear even though i'm not a fluent uh speaker of isizulu but i know a few words and but from the way he he makes the clicks and the the sounds in the language you can tell that this guy is really ready to to you know to present himself as a man of the people, especially from the perspective of language, okay? And he's also caught on, because most times when I listen to the speeches of Julius Malema, um, Cyril Ramaphosa, and all these other parties, Musi Maimane also, they usually speak English, and they switch to a dialect, and then translate the same. Gaten McKenzie also does it excellent, uh, a lot. Um, the UIM boss... Um, Neil De Beer also does it a lot. So they speak. He speaks in English and then s translates the same thing he speaks in Afri in Afrikaans. I I think that's Afrikaans and then back to English. So it's like this is a political strategy to represent and show off oneself as a person of the people. Okay, but um for 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 me right now I think. Uh, what I see from Chris Pappas is a struggle which I think whiteness and especially whiteness in South Africa has to constantly contend with. And is the fact that um, true language, a white South African has, a, especially a white, a white South African politician, would have to constantly try to speak the dialects of the locals of the people to have that as a as uh, one wing or one avenue, so to speak, to show that, yes, I'm, I'm for the people and I'm one of you and I identify with one of you, okay? And that's the challenge of language. Julius Malema does it a lot. I mean, like, when you listen to his speeches, sometimes he rambles for almost 15 minutes in, in one of the dialects in, uh, you know, I think, I don't know if probably that's, um, I don't know what language anyway, but he speaks a lot about in, in one of the dialects in South Africa and continues in, 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 in South Africa and continues in English. I see that strategy now has been picked up by the DA. So Chris Pappas is doing it a lot. But here it goes, because um, many times I struggle, because language, you see, language is only uh, a really fragile aspect of, of, um, of, of connectivity with the people, with the populace. So for me, right, I speak two Nordic languages, okay? I speak Finnish and I speak Swedish. So I speak these languages quite appreciably, okay? But there's something about language that doesn't necessarily... Um, put the heart of the speaker in the position of acceptability or connectivity with the people who speak that language, right? So there are many people who probably 
come come over to the Nordics, learn Swedish, learn Norwegian, learn Finnish, and all. But there's really that there isn't really that connection to the nation in that essence. And so this is one place where language then becomes tricky because by learning the language. You, you you tend to make the the, the other person um, safer when they see you speak in their language okay when you speak the language of the other it always makes it always creates this form of acceptability and acceptance and that you know we we are one people that can see your worldview through your language and language is actually the worldview actually is an epistemic uh, viewpoint it's an epistemic perspective through which you see into the world of another person that's what language does and so when i speak finnish or swedish i'm able to see through the worldview of the Finns or the swedes and how they see life how they see things so chris papas here in his grasp of isizulu i believe he has a perfect understanding of probably the worldview of how these people in the region see the world see the material universe see the immateriality of the universe you see how they see societal connection how they interpret capitalism and communism it's it's really important for a white person in south africa to have this grasp but then the problem then becomes the the honesty and the where the heart lies because um it's it's a, it's the problem i see with whiteness because now you have to constantly decide to to place your heart right especially the positionality take politics away to really be a person who has his heart really with the with the with the with these people you claim to speak their language and and this is a struggle so when i speak about racism not necessarily being an issue of hate but it's an issue of self interest language then becomes another layer of that definition so um i could use language in my in my in in a way to ascribe acceptance by by the people with which I try to I'm struggling to lead but then where really does my heart lie this is the question and this is the problem with whiteness in South Africa and so white South Africans would need to really contend and really come to a place of self-reflection to really ask where really does my heart lie does my heart really lie in the wider south africa does my heart lie in the concept of the rainbow nation does my heart really really lie in you know having to participate in the you know with the local, especially those in the townships. I've been studying a lot about South African townships, and I'm going to be doing a lot of videos about that. So, so, so this is a struggle, okay? Or do I, am I white in South Africa because I, um, you know, I feel more comfortable around people who look like me? That's a challenge of, we know that that's a challenge of apartheid. And even though Mandela did a lot to try to reduce those blocks, um, I'll be posting a video soon where um, Gayton McKenzie argues that the ANC has divided South Africa in the same way the apartheid, apartheid government of 1948 did. I'll post that video really soon. But that's that's a challenge of whiteness. And this is why um, the, the nation of South Africa really interests me i'm so marveled because it's I, i've i've lived with white people a lot in the in the nordics this is almost uh 10 years now or so, or so about 10 years and i'm able to understand where the people where where a lot of people we call white people um how they see life, how they interpret life, how they interpret, you know, productivity, excellence, and, and these values, exceptionalism, how they really see these issues, okay? But having to see that localized, whiteness localized within a black space, especially in the context of the African continent, and having the whites constantly have this frolicking with, 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 with black African cosmologies and all that. It's mind-boggling for me, you see. And so that's why I'm really interested in South African politics and democracy, because it's a, it's a mix of both racial this racial infiltration into each other, but at the same time, we have dynamics of power, dynamics of, um, you know, locality. We have language playing a, a role. We have the cultural um, effervescence, I mean, like the mix. So how much does a black South African in their really heavy African culture mixed with the white South African culture that has you know this this mix in terms of food what do they eat what do they drink what do how how have these two cultures come together you know even at the realm of food and at the realm of how they see life you know so these are really interesting aspects of South African society that marvels me and Chris Pappas 
is trying to present himself here as an embodiment of all of that, you know, complexity. And that's, that's why I really find him interesting. But then the debate will now be um, how much, uh, you know, his heart lies with the local people. So language is not only the, the feature that must come true, especially from white South Africa. And this is the challenge many white South African politicians I see are facing, right? Language isn't only um, that uh, factor, but there are other things involved that has to, has to define where the heart really lies. How much of self-interest have been how much has the white south african politician detracted himself from the self-interest i mean like the self-interest surrounding whiteness you see and how 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 to really reconcile that divide within the heart of the of the politician for like chris papas for example within his heart for example so this is one struggle I think I see with white whiteness in South Africa, and I see this with Chris Chris Papas. And despite the fact that he speaks fluent Isizulu, um, this struggle of acceptance, you know, is still is still going to keep on representing a clash that must be squashed for this whole rainbow concept and rainbow idea to be fused perfectly. And another criticism I have about this video is that when I look into the crowds, I do not see a lot of white people. I, I, it, it feels like it's, um, it's, a, it's a body of black South Africans having different, colored, different colors of leaders campaign for their choice, right? So that's, that's what this, this whole election for me seems. So it's like there's a dominant, especially for the DA, so there's a dominance of the, of the crowd made up of black people, a lot of black, black people, and they have the, the, the chance to choose which color of leaders would lead them. Right, I would have appreciated to see more whites in the crowd. I would have appreciated to see more white people really showing this whole appreciation and idea for this whole rainbow concept with the DAs trying to sell. Right, and it has to show also in the composition and the makeup of the crowd. But I don't see that, I don't see that at all. And so, this is one area where I'm really still struggling with how the DA interprets this whole rainbow concept. Is it just le at the level of the leadership or how, how are we seeing the rainbow consciousness um, coming true? within the populace but i don't know this has been a lot of um rambling really interesting guy chris papas i'll be posting another video where he describes um uh the minister of police in a really strange way uh you just sit back and um sit back so sit back and expect that video and see you in the next one thank you for watching guys i really hope you enjoyed this video please share and like and subscribe because that's the way you support Kwasemi as a channel, an Afrocentric channel, uh, where we try to understand um, deeper issues in African history and hopefully develop um, a collective intelligence on how we wish to build the Africa we want to see as people of Africa. See you in the next one.